Hi, John Michelle. Hi, Paul. Um, I figure we were going to do a little bit of business before uh, uh, Dr. Flowers came about. Uh, she's due on at about uh, 645. Um, Paul, is this your first meeting with us? Oops. I'm, I'm with the Michigan for single payer healthcare movement. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, and uh, I was, uh, they reached out to our organization when this yeah. event was coming up and we posted that to our Facebook page. And awesome. so I'm here uh, as a Michigan for single payer healthcare organizer. And I'm just interested in hearing her presentation. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so am I. I'm not a member. I'm sorry. I'm no. You don't have to be. Right. That, that's. That, it's not important that you. We're. We're just trying to get everybody on board with this. Um, I think a, a lot of people, um, a lot of different separate separate groups and, and groups of people believe in single payer, but um, you know, it's a matter of helping them come together, and you know, hopefully, she can shed some light on that and, and kind of steer yeah. us all in the right direction. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, oh. Here's Roger. Uh, uh, Jean Michel, we got to get you uh, up and running uh, uh, with your candidacy. Hi, Roger. Yep. It's that time. Yeah, we got to get you up and running. So I, I would like to uh, put together some kind of a, a, a candidate support committee. Uh, so we can we, we can kind of hit the ground running and get you started early. You know, uh, you know, we don't have the resources that. Um, uh, uh, do you know who a uh, Democrat is that's running or is there one? Uh, I'm not sure. No. Well, we know that uh, we know Bill Heisen is. He's got. A, yeah, he, he's he's got a lot of resources that that guy's slick. He's he's definitely. Uh, Probably one of the best used car salesmen ever. So um, you gotta you gotta start gotta start uh, start playing the game a little bit early on this guy. So it would be cool. Um, I know that I bounced around a, a few ideas. I nothing that I've I've uh, spoken to anybody about really. Just um, maybe like some sort of a lecture circuit kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of independent media out there. Um, actually, that's kind of trying to come out. Um, a lot of folks that I've just kind of run into uh, through um, Regina, uh, through Regina. So uh, maybe she can give us a list of, of you know, uh, media where you can get the, your interview and maybe whoever their listeners are can kind of get the word out. Um, um, this is the stuff that's free of cost. You know, the, <laughs> so we, we got to go there as, as much as we possibly can. You know, we know we, you know, we're not them, so we don't have the deep pockets. So you know, we're going to have to do that. But uh, hopefully uh, we can get everybody on board with that and uh, maybe put together some ideas to uh, to get your campaign started, um, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, merchandise or, or, you know, other types of support. I was even thinking about uh, um, car magnets. But, you know, that's... that's uh, something that people can, you know, can stick on their car, move it around, sell their car, take it off, put it someplace else. I mean, it's pretty flexible, pretty versatile, you know, as opposed to like just stickers. Um, so that, that's just one idea, but that's uh, something I've been kicking around. Um, the, do you know when the next uh, SMM is? I think Jennifer is uh, starting to work on that. Oh, okay. That's uh, something that should probably come up then too. Um, we should have something in place uh, so we can get some kind of support on the state level. Um, I know it's not what's on the calendar. Right, right. I know that. I know there's some glitch as far as that goes. Yeah. So, so we'll have to figure out what's going on and then have something set for when that starts. Uh, hey, Paul, how long have you been with uh, your organization? How long have you been doing this? Well, um, let's see here. How did this start out? I'm one of the founding members with the Center for Change Northern Michigan Advocacy. Oh, okay. And uh, Eli Rubin, who's our president back in 2018, 
I think that's when he originated or organized the Michigan for Single Payer Healthcare group. And they were, um, of course, for the Medicare for All legislation at the federal level. And I think Yusuf Rabi even had a bill out at one time, My Care or Michigan, Michigan Care or something, a state bill for single payer that uh, they were supporting. So um, Center for Change um, connected with uh, Eli Rubin because he was looking for people in Northern Michigan. I'm in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. And I agreed to become a volunteer for the organization in early 2019, February 2019. And I never really knew that much about single payer. I've always enjoyed getting health care whenever I needed it. I was always covered very well. I'm not a person that's been a victim or shortchanged or was without health care. But um, I feel strongly that everybody, everybody should have high quality health care. Uh, no exceptions, none of this other stuff. So I've got dedicated and involved. And I'm, in fact, I'm the health care uh, task force person for Center for Change on top of being uh, an organization, and, well, even a board member now with Michigan for Single Payer. So. I don't want to go on too long, but that's the gist of it. That's awesome, Mashoot. I'm glad you got a got a chance to to get in here. Uh, uh, I can't wait for uh, Dr. Flowers to do her thing. I got a chance to um, listen to her speak uh, the Baltimore Greens, uh, which uh, I think she's co-chair. Of the Baltimore Greens. Well, she um, she did a, a same type of uh, thing like this, an event uh, speaker series uh, for them uh, about a month or so ago. Um, so I caught part of that, like toward the end, and I was like, "Wow, we need to need to get her on board, man." She's uh, and she's been advocating for quite some time uh, for this, and I'm sure she'll you know she'll get you updated on on that kind of stuff and uh, um, uh, give you an idea of where she stands and what's going on. Um, uh, as a preview, um, um, welcome. Um, as a as a preview, um, she I think she's been she's been advocating for uh, at least probably more than ten years. I know between her and Howie Hawkins um, uh, put together the uh, legislation for it. Uh, I think that she'll probably share that with us. Uh, the the actual legislation the the, the drawn out uh, legislation so people can get a good look at it and uh, review it and uh, I think it'll probably be a good tool for people to uh, share when it comes to uh, trying to you know push the push the legislation so sort of like well here you know you can you know, we can go through it together and we can show you why this is better than what we have right now. Um, so hopefully she'll give us all that stuff. I'm sure she will. Um, Generally, with our uh, speaker series events, uh, we usually have two speakers. Um, but I figured this is this is a pretty big uh, issue and a pretty relevant issue, especially considering where we are right now. Um, uh, corporations haven't saved us. Uh, billionaires haven't saved us. Um, uh, you know, maybe this comes to us saving ourselves. Uh, so. Uh, I, I felt like it was probably best that you know she get the the the, the red carpet the full full attention. Um, so we're we'll probably give her as much time as she needs to give her initial presentation, and then uh, uh, you can uh, put the your questions in the chat, send them straight to me, uh, and I'll read them out for her, and she can address them as such. Um, this will last until seven thirty or until everybody runs out of questions. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm talking to her right now. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, oh, okay. She was co-chair, but she's not anymore. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, uh, so well, so we'll give um, give it a few more minutes and let uh, folks come on in and do their thing. Uh, whoever's interested, um, I, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Completely agree, Paul. Um, we're um, and, and this is this this whole thing is kind of basically a um, school session. You know, uh, I think if we're gonna push forward. Uh, in the future, we kind of all need to be on the same page. Um, and uh, I don't think that there's any better way to, to, you know, to do that without getting it from straight from the source. You know, she helped uh, uh, pen the legislation. So um, I think it'd be, uh, that, uh, I think it'd be the best way for us to go forward with that. Uh, hopefully, Paul, after this is all said and done, um, uh, we can start getting together, you know, our organizations can start getting together on some sorts of uh, direct actions and, and uh, you know, really start, uh, um, I don't know, maybe a, like a coalition of some sort um, to, to get it pushed. Um, the more people on board, the better. I think, I think a lot of people um, support the idea of uh, Medicare for All, but I don't know how many people know you know everything they need to know about it and why it's better so so um yeah yeah I, th I think that's the you know there's a lot of there's a lot of um there's a lot of groups out there there's a lot of organizations out there uh, uh single issue organizations you know that it's like well yeah we're for this we're for that and there are plenty of groups that are are that support single payer so um you know maybe this is the beginning of us all coming together and and uh pushing that um uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, um, this is, a, um, and I'll, I'll ask her this question because it actually came up. Um, I didn't uh, get to, to watch that part, but the question did come up, uh, the, the difference between the state and national level, you know, what, which ones would be which or how, how would that work? You know, because there's a lot of things when it comes to the, the uh, state and federal that don't always match up uh, like uh, minimum wage. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I kind of wonder myself how how that would play out. You know, and, you know, do you have to have legislation to make sure that states, you know, eat that, or you know, how does that work? So, so we'll we'll add that. Um, Barry, hello, Barry. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Doctor Flowers is already here. Hi. All right. Uh, this is, um, I guess I can go ahead and start warming up a little bit. Um, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Daryl Gibson of the Muskegon Green Party. Um, and welcome to our speaker series, the fourth edition. Um, we started this speaker series as kind of a, a way to connect uh, with the, our local communities on issues that you know, uh, affect everybody. Uh, so we figured the best way to understand the people around us and to uh, help support them or uh, serve them, um, we should uh, come together on all the things that, you know, uh, that we're affected by. Um, Tonight, um, we do have a special guest. Uh, I was saying a little earlier, um, she is addressing a very relevant issue in Medicare for All. She is uh, the director of uh, popularresistance.org and the host of Clearing the Fog Radio. She is an advisor to the Board of, of Physicians for a national health program for which she served uh, as a congressional fellow in 2009 and 2010. She is a co-founder of 
the Maryland Healthcare is a Human Right Campaign uh, and the National Organized Organizer of Hope, which is Health Over Profit for Everyone campaign, um, which I think uh, she may be planning on re, uh, restarting that. Uh, she is a past member of the GPUS, uh, Green Party of uh, the United States Steering Committee and ran for US Senate. Uh, as a Maryland Green in 2016, she is active with uh, her local party and uh, the state Green Party. Um, tonight, uh, she will be discussing, uh, advocating uh, for green Medicare for all during Biden era, era and lay out a green vision for Medicare for all and the challenges the Biden administration poses to that fight. Um, she would be uh, Dr. Margaret Flowers, if she's ready. Great, thank you so much, Daryl. And uh, great to see everybody tonight. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you. Um, so I thought I'd start out with, you, you'd want me to go through like some basics um, and then I'll get into the legislation and movement and things like that. But it's important that we also just kind of know how to talk about this and what's going on. So I will um, share with you a PowerPoint that I have. Um, let me see if I can get this to show in a way that y'all can see it. So just, I think it's really helpful for people to understand that in the United States, like we never actually created a healthcare system. And the system that we have is just kind of an accident of history. And one of the big accidents that should have been corrected a long time ago, happened around World War II in the 1940s, when um, wages were, were frozen. And so employers started trying to find ways to attract employees. And so they uh, started providing health benefits. And that's how we got a linkage between health insurance and employment. And of course, that's a system that just really uh, doesn't serve people well at all, because when people become sick, as you know, and can't work, they're most vulnerable. That's when people are apt to lose their health coverage. Um, so this is a big problem with our uh, non-system. And then the 1980s was another really fun, I mean, there's a lot of points on along our healthcare system that we could talk about, but just to do a very quick, um, I think the 1980s is another really important time because that's when, um, well, it really started in the 1970s under Nixon. Nixon passed the Health Maintenance Organization Act, which was like 1975, 1976, and that allowed uh, profit, uh, corporations to profit off of healthcare. And then in the 1980s under Reagan, he really accelerated that by actually bringing uh, investment firms into the Department of Health and Human Services and teaching them on how to take over healthcare as they called it a fertile field. Um, and so that's when I started medical school. I did my medical school in the 1980s. And it was interesting to me how there was a real shift in the language when they started saying, well, we need to talk about patients as consumers or clients, you know, don't call them patients. And it was like indoctrinating us into this business mindset. And I remember saying, well, I didn't go to, into medicine to be a business person. Like I had no interest in actual business, um, but that, you know, now a lot of doctors get degrees in business. And then as Daryl mentioned in 2009-10, I volunteered as a congressional fellow for Physicians for National Health Program. And I was down in DC pretty much every day that members were and, and even days that they weren't meeting with staffers. And, um, and I thought this was really poignant, the um, Lancet, which is a British medical journal uh, in December of 2009, which was again, like three months, four months before uh, the legislation was finalized said the health care reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the US government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence and the public interest. And that's what I found in Congress as we tried to get health experts to be testifying in the hearings, um, they, you know, we were excluded from that. And that's actually when we started a direct action campaign instead that did have some impact um, during that time. So kind of, you know, where are we right now? Um, I think it's helpful to look at the United States compared to other uh, wealthy countries. This is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and they do wonderful statistics. And, and so this slide shows the, the countries on the left, and then um, the bars show what percentage of the population is covered. And you can see that for many of the top countries, 100% of the population is covered in their healthcare system. And then you see the United States, we're second from the bottom. Um, and you know, we're just a, 
little in the 80s, like close to 90%, but pretty low compared to other countries. And then what is also interesting is looking at the um, private versus public uh, coverage. And you can see that most of the countries have almost all public coverage. Um, some have a tiny proportion that's private, but in the United States, um, you know, our private is a huge proportion of our healthcare system. And that's another problem because uh, when healthcare is for profit, it's not really about health. It's, it has all the wrong uh, incentives, perverse incentives actually. So not surprisingly, the United States is spending um, you know, much more per person than other countries spend. And in fact, if you just look at our public spending, which is the yellow bar at the bottom, the yellow and orange together are our total spending per capita. And actually this is data from 2018. So it's most likely it's you know, a few thousand dollars higher per person right now, but the proportions basically stay the same. Um, we're spending more in public dollars right now than many other countries are spending total on their healthcare system per capita, and they're providing coverage for everyone and much better health outcomes, much better quality uh, than we are. So when people say we can't afford it, we're already spending more than enough money to provide universal healthcare to, you know, in this country. It's not a matter of money, that's not a factor. And so many studies have shown, um, and even the Congressional Budget Office had a study this year, finding that we would, I think they found it might have been $650 billion in savings um, a year. And much of that is due to administrative costs. And uh, we have a very complicated, uh, administratively heavy bureaucratic paperwork, heavy system. And so this graph I think is great because it just shows the growth of physicians in yellow at the bottom compared to the growth of the administrator part. And, you know, this is more than 3000% growth we're talking about in terms of administrators. And this is, you know, ridiculous. They're not there to facilitate people getting health care. They're there to actually block people. You know, so you have all these people who are coming up with the different types of plans and then people that have to sell those plans. And then, you know, then you have to figure out once you have your plan, like where can you go? And then how much do you pay? How much do they pay? Getting authorization. I mean, it just, it doesn't make any sense. It's all designed um, for profit again, and not not about health, and that's what I experienced when I was practicing. Um, you know, and as a pediatrician, you would think, well, you know, children, you're not going to shortchange children, but oh yeah. And I had to fight all the time to be able to keep my patients in the hospital as long as they needed to get them the care that they needed. Um, this I think is important because it you know it really shows that we don't have the uninsured numbers yet uh, for this past year because that doesn't usually come out until September. Um, but just this was an interesting study that looked at the number of people, and this is from last year, losing their health insurance uh, coverage. And you can see, you know, they estimated 78 million people during the pandemic lost their health insurance. And that's, that's like families, including the dependents of uh, people as well. So I think what we're going to be finding, of course, that's improved a little bit as, you know, things are opening up and people are getting jobs again. But I think we were at about 30 million uninsured going into the pandemic. And I think I wouldn't be surprised if we're gonna be you know, in the 40s um, you know, million when we get those numbers. And then you know, I think it's really important to look at you know, the fact that people in this country, you know, even that have health insurance can't afford to use it. And if you look at you know, wages, in the United States, you see that for the bottom 20%, the you know, second group, the third group, fourth group, wages have really pretty much been stagnant. Um, and that's what we're finding actually right now, there's, you know, the new numbers have come out and in, we have inflation now, we had like a 4.2% increase in consumer prices and uh, actually hourly wages have gone down, I think 3.4% since the beginning of the pandemic. So people, even with health insurance, doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to afford the out-of-pocket costs. And this is what we find, you know, if we look at, at kind of this study, you know, of families, you know, who could really afford the out-of-pocket pocket costs and, you know, looking at deductibles in the multiple thousands, the out-of-pocket uh, limits, you see that most families just don't have the liquid assets on hand. You know, even families with insurance, almost half of them can't afford their deductibles. 63% um, of them don't have the cash on hand to handle that 
uh, out of pocket limit that they're supposed to pay. And so what does this mean? It means that you know people are going bankrupt when they have a serious illness or accident. And um, what was interesting from this study, and things improved a little bit after the Affordable Care Act, but still we have about 500,000 people each year declaring personal bankruptcy in the United States due to medical debt. What was interesting about this is that almost 80% of the people who went into medical bankruptcy had some form of health insurance when they began their illness, only 22% you know, we're uninsured when they began their illness. So it really shows you that our system is not at all working. And then I think it's important to talk about what COVID-19 has basically exposed in our healthcare system, because it has really just magnified all of the problems with our, our healthcare system. And, you know, one is that we didn't have investment in public health, so we didn't have a public health system there to deal with the pandemic. We didn't have universal care from the beginning. Um, remembering early on all the horror stories of people going to the hospital uh, to get tested and coming out with thousands of dollars in bills or, you know, having to go in for treatment and having thousands of dollars, people that didn't seek care uh, because they couldn't afford to, it. And then I think the racial disparities that we're seeing, um, you know, this has been a, a problem really since the founding of this country. And I have a whole presentation about racism in our healthcare system. It's, it's a, a, you know, endemic. But, um, but even now we're seeing with the vaccines, still huge disparities between white populations and black and brown populations in who's getting vaccinated. And we already had disparities in higher numbers of cases particularly in black population and higher numbers of deaths. And, and if you look at like who was able to stay home and work, it was more a higher percentage of white people that were able to do that, uh, looking at the population compared to black population. Um, so I like to say that, you know, our healthcare system basically has been an experiment. And if we had treated it as a study, you know, for the past 40 years, or 50 years, we would have ended it based on ethical reasons. But we've tried a market-based system. We're the only industrialized country that uses a market-based system. And we see that it is the most expensive. We have poor outcomes. Our health, our life expectancies have actually been declining over recent years. We're seeing increasing disparities, high numbers of preventable deaths. I didn't show this, but um, but if you look at other countries compared to the United States, we have extremely high numbers of preventable deaths. We're losing our doctors. This is a whole nother problem is that burnout is a huge part of uh, our system, which I experienced as a primary care physician. Many primary care doctors are burning out within 10 to 15 years of practice. I stayed in for 17 years, um, but you just, you can't you know, you go to school and you study and, and you learn these things and you get out there and you have these administrators that are telling you what your patients can and can't have. It's very frustrating. The whole system and the paperwork, everything is very frustrating. And then a very high number of people that are either uninsured or underinsured. Um, so the Affordable Care Act, I think, is important to know, you know, passed under the Obama-Biden administration in 2000. 10 in March of 2010 was based on a proposal that came out of the Conservative Heritage Foundation. It was done at the state level under Mitt Romney in Massachusetts in 2006. And I remember when that happened and the whole buzz was, oh, this is gonna be the template for the national system. <laughs> and, uh, and, it, and it was, I mean, they came in, President Obama knew what he was gonna be pushing when he got in there, you know. And, um, and so it basically was mandating people to purchase private insurance, uh, using tax credits and things to help people afford that, um, and then having a minimum benefit package. But the whole Affordable Care Act was really about bailing out the insurance industry. We had almost 50 million people that were uninsured. People were not able to afford their premiums. And this act basically forced people to have coverage. The government set up systems to sell the coverage the government subsidized the cost of the premiums and then help out, you know, it's helping out with some of the out of pocket costs. Um, but so what did the insurance companies do? You know, there was this whole thing. I mean, the insurance companies have shown that they've always been able to do an end run around any regulation that we write. And they've helped to write the Affordable Care Act. They were very busy and active during that time. I think there were eight healthcare lobbyists per member of Congress. They spent over a million dollars a day. Um, and um, basically, 
you know, there was a big thing about, well, they can't deny coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. So what the insurance companies did is they created these plans that had uh, narrow or ultra narrow networks. A lot of them cut out major health institutions, cancer centers. So yeah, you have to take somebody who has a pre-existing condition, but the place they need to go for their care is not included in their insurance. So they still have to pay out of pocket. So that whole thing was really a joke. And then the Department of Health and Human Services under the Obama administration after the passage of this was just passing out waivers left and right. Different you know, businesses would say, well, we can't do this or we can't do that. And the HHS was like, okay, we'll give you a waiver you know, for that. So uh, it, you know, it just wasn't really being enforced anyway. So what is a single payer national improved Medicare for all? Um, just very simply and basically, it means that every single person is in the same system from the time that you're born until the time that you die. It makes it very efficient. There's no means testing. There's no determining who gets what plan. Everybody's in, and this is how insurance works because we know that in any population, 80% of that population is relatively healthy and 20% of the population uses about 80% of the healthcare resources. So when everybody's in the same system, you know, it, the system is there when you need it, when you fall into that 20% that needs it. Everybody con contributes into the fund based on their ability to pay. And this is really important because the US healthcare system is ranked uh, very poorly globally in terms of our healthcare financing. We have a very regressive healthcare system. Um, and we were at 54th globally. I'm not sure where we are right now, but I'm sure it's somewhere around that. And so people at the lower income of end of the income spectrum are paying a higher proportion of their income for their health care. All medically necessary care is covered. It's really important that the single payer system be comprehensive so that people don't need any sort of supplemental coverage because when you start adding in supplemental coverage, you're adding in more administration, more bureaucracy and more cost. Um, and then uh, simplified administration, when you have one system, there's one set of rules. I'm sorry, Mace, you can be in here, but you need to be oh, Can you take him out? I'm sorry, my five-year-old has decided that he wants my attention. Okay, um, so, um, Sorry, buddy. That's okay. It's always when I try to do anything that the kids decide they need to be with me. I'm sorry. Um, uh, simplified administration, one set of rules. You know, it's very inexpensive. We can huge, you know, save hundreds of billions of dollars a year on administration under a single payer system. People have a choice. There was a lot of talk during the Affordable Care Act about people wanting choice and wanting to be able to choose their health insurance plan. And the reality is most people have no idea what health insurance plan is good for them. And I have a slide, I didn't show it, that compared different plans and showed that depending on what your illness is, different plans would be better, but nobody can plan out what their illness is going to be and pick the right plan for that illness. Um, and choice of treatment. You know, what people really want is that when they and their doctor or other health professional decide what they need, that that's what they get, not that some middle person is blocking that. Um, having a universal system also allows us to uh, have access to our health data, which we don't right now. A lot of our health data is, um, uh, what's the term? Basically, it's, um, oh, it's just dropped, what's going on in my head? Anyway, the, it's uh, the, the corporations hold on to that information, they don't share it. And it, that's the same thing with our Medicare. It's what's really interesting is that a lot of our Medicare is privatized through these, these advantage plans. And there was a couple of years ago when the um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services were going to start getting access to that those private plans, their utilization data. And there was a lot of excitement about that we can finally see what they're doing with the money that we give them. And then the they lobbied, this was under the Trump administration and uh, they, they blocked that. So we still don't know how those dollars are being used. Um, so having all that data allows us to really look at what are our healthcare needs as a nation? What are our priorities? What areas do we need to focus on? Um, so that would be, and that would have been a fantastic under the pandemic, you know, if we knew that was, I was interviewed by somebody who was writing about the UK system who was based in the, the UK where they have a national health service. 
And she was saying that they knew every single person in their system. They knew where they were, they knew who their, their primary care physician was, and they were able to target them and get the vaccines to them. And, you know, really, although the UK has had a hard time with uh, COVID-19, they were a, they had a much better system in place to deal with it. And then really important, and these are our green values, is transparency and accountability to the public. You know, that we as a public system will have a right to that information and we know who we can hold accountable for that. So I'll stop there in terms of the PowerPoint presentation, but I wanted to get a little bit into um, kind of where we are right now. And I think that what's important to know is that, you know, there has been a movement in the United States for quite some time. I think Ralph Nader in 2000, when he ran for president um, as a Green Party candidate was really instrumental in raising awareness of single payer system. But even in the 1990s under, you know, Hillary and Bill Clinton, there was a lot of talk about, you know, it was really starting to grow. And, um, and so, but we're at a place now where we have very high numbers of people in the United States who support a national improved Medicare for all. And in fact, it's even been growing, I would say over the last five, 10 years in, among people that consider themselves to be conservative, um, more than 50% now support a national improved Medicare for all. And I used to see that when I was in DC, you know, after the Affordable Care Act and there were all these Supreme Court fights and we were down there and there'd be these, you know, kind of right-wing people out there against the Affordable Care Act. And I would chat with them and I'd say, well, you know, how do you like Medicare? And they'd be like, oh, we love Medicare. Obama's trying to destroy it. And I'd say, well, what if everybody had Medicare? And they had like, think about it. They're like, oh, maybe, you know, they weren't opposed to it. They weren't averse. So I think we have wide public support for it now. Um, we do have legislation. John Conyers was really the champion of the movement. Um, you know, he was a Democrat from uh, Detroit, Michigan, who I worked very closely with. And he introduced legislation in 2003 called HR 676, uh, the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act. And that really came out of a working group paper from Physicians for a National Health Program that was also published in 2003 and then updated in 2016. And that's on the pnhp.org website, but he, you know, really was connected to the movement, put in place a framework legislation that really met the criteria of what we were looking for and what this, you know, physician working group determined would be an ideal system for the United States. When he left Congress, uh, Pramila Jayapal from Washington State stepped in to be the, you know, person who was going to take on that legislation. And I did work, you know, I'd worked closely with Con Conyers. I worked somewhat with uh, Pramila Jayapal, but uh, she was really, she has introduced a bill. She introduced it two years ago and then she reintroduced it this year. It's um, HR 1976 and it's the National Improvement, uh, Medi it's, or I guess they just call it the Medicare for All Act of 2021. Um, it has 115 co-sponsors, all Democrats on it right now. And it's pretty good. There's some, you know, there are good things in it for sure. But there's two areas where it really needs improvement. And I pushed and pushed her health staffers on this. And, and um, her health staffer was actually an economist and not a health policy person, which is always hard. Um, but anyway, the two things that one is that the Conyers bill said that all entities within the healthcare system had to be not pro nonprofit. And if, an entity was not willing to become nonprofit that the government would buy that out. And this is really important because as we're already seeing with hospitals closing in major cities like Hahnemann in Philadelphia, St. Vincent's in New York City, there was one in Los Angeles, I can't remember the name of it. These hospitals that longtime hospitals serving mostly you know, poor communities, their real estate is much more valuable as something not a hospital. So they're basically being closed down and turned into luxury condominiums and retail space. And so if we tell you know, some entity that it needs to now become a not profit or it's not gonna be able to make a profit, um, they're just gonna turn it into something else and we're gonna lose all that healthcare infrastructure. So the Jayapal bill does not buy out these facilities like the Conyers bill did. Um, and that's a, a huge problem. And then the other problem was that they have a two-year implementation. So the Conyers bill basically said that January 1st of whatever date is 
at least a year from the passage of the bill. So say the bill passed in July of one year, then it would begin January, not the following year, but the year after. Um, everybody's in, right? The, the system starts, everybody's in it. And that's really important because you, you don't get the savings of the system that you need to pay for it. And if you don't have everybody in it all at the same time, you know, we're trying to make things simple. And so the Jayapal bill has a two year implementation that basically leaves out everybody between like 19 and 55 for the first year. So it covers children up to 19 and then adults down to 55. And that's like almost half of the population. And there's no reason for it. When I said, what's your justification for this? Cause it doesn't make an economic sense. It doesn't make any sense really. Why are we gonna maintain our broken system for this whole population for a year? Um, all they could tell me was it was better than uh, Sanders bill because he had a four year implementation, which was also terrible, which I did a whole critique of that as well. Um, so it wasn't based on any health policy or anything. It was just based on, well, it sounds better than what, what Sanders was doing. Um, so those we need to work on. I think in terms of, you know, there's a broad movement. I think what's been, um, make, makes me optimistic is that more and more types of social movements in the United States are taking this on as one of their demands. Um, so we see it in a lot of like, um, particularly in the South, a lot of the organizing that's going on, worker organizing and black organizations down there, you know, really see this as a as part of their priority. And when there was a lot of talk at the beginning of 2020 of trying to organize a general strike, Medicare for all was one of the top demands, you know, in there for that. Um, so the, you know, there is broadening of the movement, although we need to broaden it even more. I think what's um, concerning to me is, and we saw this at the beginning of this congressional session, is that a lot of the establishment organizations, including PNHP, which I'm a member of, their strategy is to elect more Democrats. And, um, and so they're in a situation now where they're afraid to criticize the Democrats. They don't wanna lose access to them. And so when there was a big call um, to, at the beginning of this con congressional session to force Pelosi, the speaker, to have a floor vote on Medicare for all, it was the established single payer organizations that gave the political cover to the Democrats to not do that. So basically the argument was, there's all these progressives who ran on Medicare for all, Pelosi's running again to be the speaker. If I think it was like as few as five or six of them refused to vote for her as speaker unless she would do a floor vote for National Improved Medicare for All, you know, that we could get that. But instead they were given political cover by these establishment groups. The establishment groups actually attacked the people that were pushing, mostly young people that were pushing for this, you know, force the vote. Um, and when I talk to folks, you know, that I've known for a long time in the movement, this is what I'm hearing from them is, well, we just have to elect more Democrats. So that's a huge mistake. I think the other mistake is that we're starting to see some of the you know, progressive Democrats um, pushing lesser reforms. So saying like, yeah, we're for national improved Medicare for all, but um, we'd be okay if we lowered the age of Medicare, or we'd be okay if there was a public option. And this is a problem for us because you know, what we're fighting for is a universal healthcare system and we have the money to pay for it. There's no reason why we don't have it right now you know, in terms of, doesn't make any sense. We could do it very quickly. We have the infrastructure through our national Medicare system. Every health professional has a provider number. We could move very quickly to a universal system. There's no reason why we should accept anything less than that. It's just delaying it and it's, it'll suck away a lot of political energy. And it basically means that people are still gonna suffer and die needlessly. So I, you know, always say that the least the smallest step we can take is a national improved Medicare for all. There's a lot we need to do with our healthcare system beyond that to address disparities, to build our infrastructure. We've been losing hospitals, you know, for a long time at an alarming rate, um, and you know the percentage of beds that we have now is very small. So the smallest step is to get everybody into a system and then pay for it publicly so that you know people don't have to worry about financial barriers um, to care. So any of these incremental steps are just, 
there it's expected if you look at kind of social movement dynamics if you look at how the opposition tries to undermine social movements it's always by telling them they're asking for too much and you can have this little thing and then we'll do what you want later and later never comes so um so those are kind of two areas this electing democrats and and moving accepting lesser reforms i think are problematic so what do we do now i think daryl you mentioned this the importance of educating people um, to know, you know, why we need this system, what it is, how it works, that we have legislation. Um, education is always important. The second thing is um, expanding out our base. We really do need to continue bringing more folks into the single payer fold. Um, so, um, and this is my four year old. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just you know, reaching out to, to groups that are not already in in the in the movement, you know, and and educating and building relationships with them and, and bringing them in. And then I think the third thing is really pressuring people who are in Congress. And that was a big part of why I ran for Senate in 2016. It was an open seat. The Democrat that was running has this, you know, re re uh, people look at him as being a very progressive person and he's very far from progressive. Chris Van Hollen, he's one of the biggest money you know, raisers in the Democratic Party. And, uh, and I didn't want him to get away with this veneer of being a progressive. I wanted to be able to challenge him, you know, and, and I was able to get into a lot of the, um, the different forums and things that happened and, you know, basically call him out. So, um, so I think it's really important for Greens to be out there running and, and challenging these progressives um, and also just pressuring the people who are in office. There's 115 co-sponsors of the legislation but very few, very few of them are talking about it. Very few of them have even anything about it on their website. Very few of them are doing anything to advocate for it. And they're getting this, you know, this cred of having being a co-sponsor of the legislation, but they're doing absolutely nothing for it. So we need to start holding their feet to the fire and say, oh, well, if you really, and that's what the force to vote was about. It was about, you know, putting people on the record. Do you support this or not? Um, and so I think that that's, we really need to step up our game in terms of making them feel the heat of having to actually do something, you know, to make this a reality. So um, that's kind of where we are. I did want to, I saw the question about state versus national. And I um, have written about this and uh, actually I also have like a one pager on, on this, but I do not support state efforts. Um, I did at one time, I even wrote our state legislation back in 2004. Um, 2005 around that time. Um, and there's a number of reasons. One is, I think somebody mentioned it, the waivers. You need, uh, I think it's like eight different federal waivers in order to get a state bill. So you have to be able to get the Medicare funding. You have to be able to get the, you know, there's the um, Veterans Health Administration. There's the Federal Employees Health Benefits Plans. There's, you know, TRICARE, all these kind of federal systems that we have that states would need to get their dollars. Another big impediment is the ERISA, the Employee, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which basically doesn't allow states to regulate private insurance, you know, business employer insurance. And there have been a couple of court cases over the last decade or so around that. And they've always, like those court cases set even worse precedents. So states can't even ask the employer insurers for the information about their, you know, their population, how they're using their healthcare dollars. Um, and so a lot of the state legislation that is written skirts that. They don't say that employees have to be in their state system. They basically say that, well, we're gonna make our state system so attractive that employers are gonna want their employees to be in it because they know they can't regulate them to be in it. So there's really no way at the state level to have an actual single payer system with all these different parts that you can't put into it. And if we're gonna have a fight at the congressional level, why are we fighting for waivers for one or two states to get a, a you know, a, a bill as opposed to fighting for what we need, a national for Medicare for all. The other problems with the state is that state budgets have to be balanced. A federal budget doesn't. And so states are going to run into financial difficulties, you know, if they have, you know, people that are, have serious, you know, health problems. And that means that they're going to be cutting benefits or cutting or shifting more costs onto people. This is what we've seen whenever states have tried 
universal type of systems, they've always run into cost problems they've never been able to achieve what they said they were going to achieve in terms of who was covered. And then I think the, the third and really important piece of this is, I don't know if you're familiar with something called the Southern strategy, you know, the Dixiecrats in the you know, 20th century, they knew that state having policies at the state level was much better than at the federal level, because when you have a state policy, particularly in the South, they can, you know, do it the way that they, that they want. They can make, you know, they can discriminate basically uh, against people. And so we don't want, you know, 50 different state systems of varying quality. We want a national system that any person anywhere in the country has the same level of care, can go where they need. If you're traveling, you can get care where you are. If you have a special condition and you need to go out of state to a facility, you can go there. You know, we're not trying to create 50 different, like Medicaid. I mean, there's a lot of variation in Medicaid. The progressive states have better systems. The, the regressive states uh, have worse systems. So that's not the type of system that we're, that we're trying for. And I really worry, you know, I mean, I don't think California and New York are ever going to pass a national through, I mean, a, a state bill. They just, um, I remember in California, they passed it when Schwarzenegger was in office, like 2006, 2008. And then when they got a Democratic governor, I was out there in 2010 for a big lobby day. And I met with the person who was the lead staffer for the Senator who was the champion of that bill. And she's like, oh yeah, I mean, now that we have a democratic governor, nobody wants, no no Democrats in the state legislature want to touch it. They were doing it when there was a Republican because they knew it would get vetoed. You know, they, they wouldn't be signed into law. Uh, but as soon as there's a Democrat and they knew people were going to expect that Democrat to sign it into law. I mean, it's kind of like where we are now with Biden, right? Biden ran and against Medicare for all. and so a lot of the Democrats in Congress are not willing to push him on that. And, then, and that's why even people like Sanders are starting to talk about lesser reforms of lowering the age of Medicare and things like that. So, um, so that's, that's basically in a nutshell why the state is not a good idea. And I think I'll stop there. And then that gives us a little bit of time for some questions. So I hope that was helpful to everyone. All right. Well, that was awesome. That was amazing. Um, a whole lot of information in there. I do have a, uh, before everybody gets started uh, with their questions, I do have a, a few questions that were uh, given to me to folks who, who can't, uh, who can't attend. So I'll go ahead and read a few of those off. Uh, there has been some talk of the American Rescue Plan. Do you support the American Rescue Plan and why or why not? Yeah, so I actually did write an article about this for Truth Out, and I think it was called something like Biden puts profit over people or something like that. Um, the American Rescue Plan basically it was again ordered by the insurance industry. There was a, a consortium of uh, in, insurance lobbyists and uh, big business, you know. Uh, Chamber of Commerce and Business Roundtable and all those folks are always part of this. And basically they put out like what they wanted and that's what's in the American Rescue Plan. So it's basically giving more money to insurance companies, um, but not to people. And, it, and, and so it has things in it like, okay, we're going to increase the uh, amount of money that the federal government will give towards purchasing premiums, but nothing to help people cover the out-of-pocket costs. So that premium money goes directly into the pockets of the health insurance company. People have this insurance, they still can't afford the thousands of dollars they have to pay up front before they can use it. And it has things like um, trying to attract more insurance companies into, you know, because there is not really any choice out there. If you look on the health insurance exchange, it's basically, you know, in most states, there's maybe one or two choices. Um, the the ins major insurers kind of carve up the country, just like the, you know, telecommunications do the internet providers and be like, okay, that's your share of the market and they have a monopoly there. Um, so it's, it, you know, all types of financial incentives to try to entice insurance companies because there's this whole myth of competition is going to, you know, lower the, the prices and that just hasn't ever panned out in the United States. So overall, you know, there's a few good things in it, but overall it's just, again, putting more money in the hands of the private insurance industry that we're trying to, you know, we've just been strengthening them <laughs> over the last 11 years. We're just 
they're making them more powerful. Their profits have been outrageous after the Affordable Care Act. Um, if you look at their stock market trends, you know, they, they made a whole lot of money from that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, how is your version of Medicare for All different from other systems like the NHS in the UK? Yeah, so, and actually, you know, when Howie Hawkins ran uh, for president, I helped craft his um, health uh, platform. And actually, so the, the green platform under Hawkins was to start immediately with a national improved Medicare for all, just get everybody into the system, but then over a period of years, evolve that into a national health service. So the way that the Medicare for all is, would work is, is like our traditional Medicare, where everybody pays in publicly through taxes um, and then you know can use it, but the providers are not owned and operated by the government. So your hospitals would still be your hospitals, the practices would still be the practices. The UK system is like our Veterans Administration. It is, you know, which I know you're making a face. Our VA is really um, underfunded, but if you look at its performance, it's much better, it performs much better than our private healthcare system. And if it was fully funded, it, it would be great. Um, so the NHS, which has also been under attack ever since the Thatcher years, um, and is still under attack uh, with under, you know, underfunding and privatization and things like that. Um, but it is, the government owns a system, they operate the system, they, they own the facilities, they pay the health professionals directly. So it's a fully public system as opposed to Medicare, which is like publicly financed, but privately in some ways delivered, you know, public and privately delivered. Yeah, see, this is, this is a, a lot of this information, I had no idea. So I appreciate you uh, straightening all this stuff out. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, wouldn't this kill the private medical industry, insurance industry? Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the whole point. <laughs> why, why do they exist? They, 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 they're a financial industry. They're a financial service. They are there to make money for their investors. And they do that by raising the premiums as high as they can by shifting as much of the cost as they can onto the individuals and then denying payment for care. They call payment for care a medical loss. So that's how they view paying for actual health care. Um, they are, I mean, they're like the vampire sucking the blood out of our system. They, they're the one, they're the problem. They're the blockade. They're the reason that people are suffering and dying because the health insurers deny them the, the care that they need. Um, so yeah, there have been a lot of industries that have come and gone throughout time. And this is one that we just really don't need. And there's other insurances and, and they know it. They know this day is going to come. You know, they're, they actually are, the health insurance companies are some of the biggest realtor holders. Like if you look in every major city, they have giant buildings. You know, they, <laughs> they have a lot of money, a lot of infrastructure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, out here. We are uh, in the Muskegon area. There's uh, uh, there's hospital buildings and crap all over the place, and they just keep popping up, man. Like you know, Toys R Us goes out, uh, hospitals come in. I don't yep. know. Yep. Yep. And the um, dialysis centers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, because that because dialysis is covered by Medicare, so it's a guaranteed payer. So you put up a dialysis center, and you're going to make money. You don't have to worry about whether people have insurance or not. Mm. And it's um, a whole, I mean, there's lots of studies looking at those dialysis centers and that they, they don't do full treatments for people. They don't properly clean their equipment between patients. Like they, they run like a business, not like a health facility, you know. I didn't know that either. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, actually just one other thing I wanted to mention really fast is, Hospitals are, and especially we're seeing this around here in Baltimore where I live, are kind of getting rid of their essential services and focusing more on the money-making services of like cardiovascular and orthopedic. So we have a healthcare system that's nonprofit in Maryland called MedStar that has been shutting down OBGYN departments, pediatrics departments, psychiatry with no warning. Like they basically told a whole pediatrics department in two days, you're gone. And that meant the pediatric emergency room as well. 
So um, and that was so that they could build, you know, expand out their orthopedics and their cardiovascular. So this is also hugely problematic and part of the for-profit model is that they don't care if you don't have a place to take your sick child or deliver your baby because they're not gonna make money off of that. So another just fun fact. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I got, well, I got a couple more, but I'll, I'll just read one more. I see a couple of uh, questions might come up uh, from the uh, folks. Um, it says, uh, will Medicare for all eliminate existing medical debt? Um, it won't eliminate existing debt, but it will end any future debt. You know, if you talk to people in other countries with universal systems, they think medical debt is ridiculous. Like it doesn't exist exist there. So um, no, I, there's nothing in the legislation that says it would get rid of current debt. All right. But that, um, like the student debt, that should be another campaign. Yeah. Um, um, uh, how would uh, Medicare for All impact those on Medicare? Uh, speak to the improvements for those on Medicare Advantage if we switch to Medicare for All. Yeah, that's a good question because um, that's why I always call it national improved Medicare for all because people will say, well, Medicare is not all that great. You know, I still have to, it doesn't cover dental or vision or hearing, um, these kinds of things. And particularly the advantage plans. Um, I've had personal experience through that, with that through my partner Kevin's um, parents. And, um, you know, if you need rehabilitation or things like that, the advantage plans are terrible. Um, so under National Improved Medicare for All, people who currently have Medicare will have better coverage. You will have no deductibles, no co-pays, so nothing out of pocket. You'll have complete care, vision, hearing, um, uh, long-term care. I didn't mention that, but the legislation includes long-term care. You know, people right now have to spend down their assets so they can qualify for Medicaid. A lot of people, if you can't afford long-term care and long-term health insurance is a joke, it's a ripoff. So, um, so this would actually improve coverage for people who are currently on Medicare. Yeah. yeah. Sound good. Um, and it would cover 100%, not 80%. Right, right. You wouldn't need a supplemental, and it would cover right. your drugs. You wouldn't need a drug plan. Yeah. Uh, and mental health is also a component of that as well. Right. Exactly. So it is a very important uh, coverage. And coverage, you know, I remember, you know, Kevin's father had a major stroke in 2017, and Basically, the, the facility decided he wasn't improving fast enough, and so they sent him home. And when I said to the therapist, would you expect someone to improve any faster than what he is? And she said no, but that's what the insurance company decided. So he was sent home with an 89-year-old wife, and he was completely paralyzed. He couldn't move his arms or his legs. And they got three days of four hours a day nursing. And even the nurse didn't come every, you know, it was more like two days. So we literally had to be there every morning and night to get him in and out of bed and, you know, do his care. And um, I mean, so the, under the National Improved Medicare for All, it would cover in-home care um, for everybody. And actually, you know, when it comes to mental health and things like that, they prioritize community-based care as opposed to just institutionalizing folks. So that's another really important piece of the legislation you know, home and community-based. Does that answer your question? Does that cover it? I'm sorry, I can't remember now what the question was. Did I answer it? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, oh, where can we find more details about Medicare for All legislation? So it is called HR 1976. So if you go to like congress.gov and look it up, you can read it. Um, Physicians for a National Health Program is another excellent resource, pnhp.org. And they have fact sheets and things like that on it. I was starting to really revamp the HOPE campaign, but then we had a family medical emergency and I now am the um, sole legal custodian of a four and five-year-old, which I didn't expect. My kids are all grown. <laughs> Didn't expect to be doing mom again, but um, so that's put a little cramp in my my organizing. But the folks that I work with are, are continuing to carry that on, so um, so that should be 
hopefully we'll get the hope campaign up and running again soon but i would say pnhp is probably the best place to get information well we won't keep you for too much longer we i understand they demand your attention and you know priorities here um uh, i'm very attached it's <laughs> and they've had uh, a really rough life so they need there's to be nothing wrong with someone. That. Yeah. yeah i get it yeah um uh, let me see uh, uh do you have any uh, examples of uh, direct action to help push for Medicare for all. Yeah, I mean, well, we even did a single payer direct action camp in I think 2018. Um, and we did a lot in 2009 and 2010. You know, we went to the hearings in Congress and disrupted them. Um, we went to the briefings and spoke out. We um, had a campaign in the fall of 2009 called uh, mobilization for healthcare reform, and we had hundreds of people arrested going to private insurance corporations and protesting them because of their denial of uh, payment for care uh, for people. Um, people have gone, and we saw this, it was really amazing. After Trump was, uh, you know, when he took office in early 2017, and there were all these healthcare town halls, people all across the country were going to those town halls and demanding Medicare for all, even in, you know, very conservative areas, this was happening and people were, you know, bringing in signs and, you know, being somewhat disruptive there. Um, so those are all things that people can do, um, go and have, holding rallies outside of their members' offices. We've done a lot around the country of holding town halls and inviting members of Congress. And then when they don't show up, having an empty seat for them and basically holding the town hall anyway. Um, so there's lots of different things that people can do on the HOPE website. You know, it just it isn't active right now because I haven't been able to keep it up, but there are still some resources there. And there's a section on action and it gives ideas. Um, I had put together a whole toolkit for the Poor People's Campaign uh, back when they really started and, and I worked with them on kind of their Medicare for all activism. So people can find that toolkit as well. Okay. Okay, good. Well, um, okay, go ahead, Barry. So I, I don't share your opinion in terms of uh, this happening uh, nationally first. And, uh, and it's because so many of the legislators take so money so much money from the uh, those who profit off of our illness. Um, uh, it is uh, it is easier, although not much, to influence state legislators. Um, uh, and and I'm even I'm, I'm abandoning that, considering what just happened in California. Uh, we had legislation uh, introduced in February. Um, a, a number of people signed on. Um, and after the introduction of it, there was silence that came out of Sacramento. In San Francisco, three of the, of the five principal co-authors were our, our, our state senator and both state assembly persons. Not once did they actually, I'm on their email list and, and I, not once was there any mention that they actually were a principal co-author of this amazing legislation. Um, it, it just absolute silence. And it, it's almost as if the author didn't check with the leadership of the party before it was introduced. And, and it, it's, it's uh, you know, oh yeah, we'll bring it back next year. Um, <laughs> I'm getting tired of actually working with any legislator on it uh, because they, they I've seen time and again Yes, I'm an advocate for this. Yes, I'm an advocate, but then they're silent. Um, I believe that in a, a state environment, we have in California in particular, we have an initiative process and it will be decided in California on the ballot one way or another. If the legislature did something, um, the insurance industry would quickly respond uh, by putting something on the ballot to take it away. Um, I, I, and I don't believe, you know, Don Beckler's model, um, God rest his soul, um, was to try to get individuals to sign up, identify people, sign them up, um, try to educate folks, blah, blah, blah. blah. And it, it was in 15 years, 20 years of working with him, we accumulated a database of 35,000 people. We need 9 million to pass legislation in California. 
So I'm playing around with a different idea of trying to do organizing. Um, uh, and that is by trying to identify organizations who will actually tell, them, tell us their best estimate of how many people, members of their organization would actually support Medicare for all if it was on the ballot. And, and to build, because no one organization can handle that kind of voter ID project It'd be so huge. Um, I, I'll let you know how it goes um, in just the beginning stages of this. Um, uh, but it's, we've got to do something that actually, whether or not it actually crafts something, if we're able to identify a huge number of people, polls say it's very popular but we don't have them identified as voters. We don't have a direct connection to them to be able to talk uh, to, uh, uh, you know, and again, a single organization, if I send you an email and you don't know who I am, it'll go in the spam folder. But if you're a member of a, of a union local or a church or a, any other type of organization that you're, you know, and those people are sending you calling you or communicating with you, it's greater chance that they actually will respond. So it's a different type of voter ID project. Um, um, I'm still working to develop it. And um, um, uh, hopefully within a few months, I'm gonna have some good news to, uh, uh, to be able to report back as organizing strategy. And either way, whether it does ultimately move something here in California or actually causes our congressional delegation uh, to stand up and do more, um, it is got to be through identifying voters so that they know we have people organized uh, to actually demand what we need. Yeah, well, it is, you know, it is about expanding the base and yes. We, it's going to take a mass movement to win this. I mean, you and I yes. are going to disagree about state because I just don't see it possible to be done at the state level. And even the California bill is not actually a single payer bill. It's, it's like a more like a path to single payer. And I think if yes. it, it, even if it did pass, then California is going to be focused for the next 20 years on trying to make that a path. And what does that do to the national fight to take out, you know, our, yeah. a large yeah. state? It, it, it just takes us away from a national legislation. But uh, but I agree with you that, you know, it's got to be building the movement and any any way that you can do that is more power to you. It's good. Yes. Well, we did. We got a lot of work to do because what do we have half of the Democratic caucus in Congress right now and all the Republicans are against us. So it's it's three quarters of people in Congress and and even the ones who signed on as as to be co-sponsors. Uh, it, it's. Yeah, you mentioned they don't they're, they're not champions they don't go out and talk about it it's in name only yeah so I think it's, it's important and this was something that i really realized and part of why i became you know created popular resistance is that i honestly don't think that we're going to win medicare for all in isolation i think it's got to be part of you know it, it's got to be part of a movement that really is a mass movement that recognizes all of these different things that we should have. And mm -hmm. um, I've spent a lot of time now with learning about the revolutions in Latin American countries and, you know, and how did they win the changes? Mm -hmm. and, and it was really about changing everything, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and we have, we live in a failed state right now, honestly, right. our, our country can't even provide the basics for its population. And, and so, I think it's, you know, we got to always be connecting this to the bigger picture of the changes that we need in the United yes. States. Food, housing, healthcare, good jobs. Exactly. Yeah. And food's a big part of it. <laughs> yes. Controlling, controlling the food is very important. All right. I'd like to say, too, um, I'm in northern Michigan. I'm in the Upper Peninsula. Um, we have like in our congressional district, 32 counties, and it's all very small, sparsely populated. You know, my county is the second largest, I believe in Michigan. We have 36, 37,000 people. So it kind of gives you an idea of getting communication out to these populations is much more difficult because everybody is so 
wide apart, spread apart. But the importance of educating people about Medicare for all is, in my area, that's extremely important. I can't tell you how many people have no idea what it means. They can say the words Medicare for all, but they really don't understand what it means. There's a lot of misconceptions and bad information. And then of course, I don't have to tell you about the, the socialism accusations <laughs> and attacks and whatever, you know, it's, it's uh, in a conservative area, that's one of the favorite um, attack words. Oh, it's socialism. Um, so to me, to get to this movement that we all want to see happen, we need to, we have a really heavy lift in some regions of the country on educating the people about it. And I believe, I firmly believe that if we educate and focus on that and get more and more people educated about it, I think they will join the movement and naturally want it. But in my area, that's really, really, to me, that's an important priority. Yeah, and we actually do have conservative people in the movement for National yes. Medicare for All and mm -hmm. um, that, that have done Ed Weisbart. I don't know if you know of Ed, who's done a really good job of how to talk to conservatives. Um, we have a doctor down in Virginia um, who's always getting letters to the editor and to the newspaper, and he's written the seven C's of single payer, you know, the conservative values of single payer. So there are ways to message, you know, and reach people. And I, you know, really, if you start talking to anybody and you're having an honest conversation about the situation, they're naturally going to come to the realization that this is what we need to do. Uh, but it's building that relationship and that trust that's really important. I've been wondering that when the, because I come out of a small business background, and I've, I've really been wondering when the business community is going to wake up and, and to realize uh, that their colleagues in the insurance industry are taking them to the cleaners. And That's and happening. There's a guy, um, he did a documentary and I'm blanking on the name of it, right? Oh, it's called Fix It. Um, yes, Fix yeah. It. Yeah, and, uh, and he has started this group. It's like business leaders for single payer. And, yes. And, and there are some states, I think California has their own kind of chapter, um, which I have the name of the people that run that. I just don't remember it off the top of my head, but um, I've been in touch with them. So that 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 constituency is is starting to happen as well. It's growing. Yeah. It's growing. Yeah. Uh, the one in California is struggling, and and uh, uh, it's it, you know there's no money to pay for organizing. <laughs> so and people in the business community, their primary focus um, is on their businesses, and um, it's it's healthcare. Yeah, it's an increasing problem uh, for their bottom lines. And, and that is what will be the motivation, is, is when they can no longer afford to actually, because it's part of compensation packages that, that you have to be able to offer. Um, um, I, McDonald's, uh, no, they, they don't provide anything. So it's, it's, uh, it's whatever, it's. Yeah, yeah. I'm continuing to try to work. I cover a lot of bases here in California, so. Well, yeah, great. Well, very um uh anyway uh, thank you very much for your presentation today yeah sure. um uh barry i want to make i uh, want you to make sure that you keep in touch with what you're doing uh, uh and let us know how all that works out um uh, maybe it's something that we can you know some of your methods we can try out here in michigan uh and get something done um uh paul uh, you and i will definitely talk uh in the future uh as far as collaboration we do have uh, a couple of green groups near you, uh, green party groups near you. So uh, we need to get, get this thing started. Um, Dr. Flowers, I'm sorry we kept you so long. Uh, this was supposed to be a lot shorter, um, but I do appreciate you coming. Um, sure. You know, uh, if you uh, would be up for it, uh, maybe a, a bigger uh, venue uh, down the road, uh, sure. uh, maybe, maybe a SMM or something like that, state membership meeting. Or something where uh, we can really push this. Uh, there are several issues that uh, I know with the Green Party. Uh, I think we need to be a lot more aggressive uh, as far as getting these things done. 
it, it's been proven that you know we're we're not going to get it from the Republicans. We're not going to get it from the Democrats. There's no reason why they would give it to us. Um, they know a lot of people are going to vote for them anyway, so you know they they don't really matter. So I, I think we we can kind of be the uh, the catalyst for for a big movement, and uh, I hope that you'll continue to be a part of that. And I appreciate you coming. Sure. No, thank you for doing this, for organizing it, Daryl, and reaching out and. And uh, yeah, keep in touch. If I can be helpful in any way, let me know. Thank you so much. Oh, and uh, say goodnight to the babies, by the way. I will. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, you guys. Well, I'm going to finish this up. Uh, anybody uh, got any parting words of wisdom before we head out? <laughs> no, she's gone. But I, I do think it was an excellent presentation. I've seen a lot of Medicare for All presentations, and hers is an outstanding one. So. Thank you very much for putting the word out on that. Absolutely, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you got a chance to uh, to, to to be here, man. Um, uh, like I said, um, uh, I'm gonna put you in touch uh, afterwards with our group near you. Uh, that doesn't mean that you and I won't be talking because I am an officer uh, in on the state level as well as here in the local level. Um, right. So I, I think maybe this could be the beginning of our movement here in Michigan. Um, uh, and, you know, there are some of the things that she uh, pointed out, I thought were uh, very interesting as far as, you know, uh, businesses for single payer, uh, uh, conservative single payer. Uh, we can all, you know, know that we can agree on something, um, you know, and, and I think if you have a broad coalition of people who touch a, a spectrum of people across the state, I think you'll have an easier time uh, um, bringing people into the movement. Uh, educating folks because uh, I think was well, Barry. I think he said um, a lot of people just don't know. You know, they they know the words single payer, but you know the what what does it really mean? What's the legislation? Why is it better? Um, so I, I think that you know if you do have a, a wide movement uh, of people who who uh, or organizations who can come together, um, I, I don't know, man. I think it could be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. So. Absolutely. I've started to use, um, uh, you know, because there's been debate over the years as to whether single payer is a good term to use or uh, uh, Medicare for all, uh, you know, it's certainly um, not everybody understands that. And, and certainly younger people, they I really don't have an idea about Medicare. And, and many older folks don't even know about the problems with Medicare. Um, I, I, so I've, I, you know, I've heard somebody I've used the phrase guaranteed health care for all. And right. I kind of like it. That's, that's need health care. You got it. Yeah. I heard another <laughs> um, phrase too. Um, USA universal. Um, maybe the second word, what might have been simple and affordable or accessible, something like that. So there are different labels that we could come up with and try to get one that's gonna be much more uh, meaningful and less confusing. Cause I agree with you, Medicare for all elicits yeah. different uh, responses from people. They each have their own different uh, individual interpretation of what that is. Right. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I think that, you know, um, a common, you know, a common name for for the movement uh, is important. Uh, so when you do describe it, it'll, it'll mean a specific thing as opposed to. Oh, OK, sorry. Uh, it'll, it'll mean something specific as opposed to, you know, this big, wide ranging thing that mm -hmm. nobody actually knows. You know, well, what does yours mean? Well, what does his mean? Uh, well, what does mine mean? And so I, I think we that would probably be a good start uh, to come up with that. You know, the uh, I'll let you guys go in a sec. The 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 funny thing about this whole movement is uh, um, I served in the Marine Corps uh, in, uh, back in the early '80s, and uh, we had a single payer or, or a form of it uh, to where we we didn't need a, a copay or or a deductible or any of that. You just showed up a sick call and you got taken care of and you got sent home. So I don't understand 
especially there's people, you know, there's guys that I serve with who are against it. And I, I'm not sure why to this day. So uh, that, that's going to be a, a work in progress. But um, uh, make sure you guys uh, uh, keep in touch with me. Um, you can uh, um, you can send me an email at uh, info at muskgp.org. Um, or you can find our uh, Facebook page and, and uh, send me a message that way. Um, I, I will get it, whatever message you send. I'm the co-chair, so I'll, uh, I'm one of the first people that'll see it. Um, uh, Barry, I wanna, want you to make sure that you keep me posted on what you guys are doing. Okay. Uh, like I said, we, you know, if you, if, even if it's not, it doesn't turn out the way that you expect it to, uh, there, there are gonna be some aspects of it that you can still continue to use. Um, so we're, we're going to need that information. Uh, I, I just strongly feel that um, uh, we've done a lot of standing on street corners and talking to people, you know, going to marches and rallies and, uh, 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 you know, farmers markets and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks and, and, uh, uh, and that's all good. Um, but if we begin to identify organizations that support it and make use of, let them do the work with their members, right. um, I, I think we'll be more effective. We'll have a broader reach. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it is a different, it's, it's a, perhaps a faster way of movement building. Um, mm -hmm. It's identified the organizations who uh, will work uh, with us. Um, I'm trying to pose a question to the Green Party of California out here. If we had um, a, a Medicare for all guaranteed healthcare on the ballot, how many of our registered Greens would actually show up to vote for it? And yeah, you can go back and take a look at historical voter turnout based on political party registration. But then the question is, okay, how can we increase that? Right. You know, if there's so many greens that don't show up, well, how do, how do we engage people? Right. And how do we engage our greens to actually be engaging others in their community? Right. So it's not just us having to do all the work trying to. Oh, no, not at all. Well, I can, I, can, uh, I can give you a, a, I mean, I can't guarantee, but I, I can tell you that you'll probably have a really strong showing among greens. Uh, being that uh, we do have a history, oh yeah, single payer, so you'll probably get a pretty uh, strong showing uh, from Greens, and that oh. might be a uh, 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 a good way to reach out uh, to start your movement. So, like I said, I'm yep. going to get with Paul. I'm going to get with Paul, and we're going to start the ball rolling out here in Michigan. So Good. hopefully, we'll connect somewhere down the road. You know, the three of us here. And, what what <laughs> and, part of Michigan are you from? I'm uh, I'm on the, the west coast of Michigan. I'm in Muskegon. Okay. And I grew up about, in Rochester. About, and, oh, and, no, you're yeah, you're you're the other side. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you're the other side. And Paul, yeah. you're what about six or eight hours north of me? Yeah. Oh, I'm in the Upper Peninsula. Yeah. I'm I'm about a half mile or half an hour drive north of Mackinac Bridge. So oh, okay. that's whatever the time yeah. is from your yeah, place. Yeah. To all yeah, that's a that, that's a solid six hours. So yeah, that, that's, up, that's up there a little ways. But I, I did want to ask you, Daryl, um, how do you spell your first name? Because I know I know several people named Daryl as a spell. Yeah, and they all spell it different. <laughs> uh, it, it would be D A R R Y L. Thank you. Yeah, or you like I said, you guys can contact me with the the email I, I give you, or you can. Go to our, uh, we're on Facebook, um, we're on Instagram, Twitter, um, a couple other social media. Um, so you guys can contact me that way and I'll be sure to get it. Like I said, I'm, I'm one of the first people that'll see the message. So, but yeah, uh, we'll just, it in that way. I, I don't do any of the social media. It, it just, well, <laughs> yeah, it, it's tough, especially Facebook. It's tough. It's yeah, tough. I know. I mean, I used to write computer code and, and I owned and operated my own. <laughs> Temporary employment service. I wrote the code to create my own payroll program, invoicing program, and all that. Right. And sometime in the '90s, I just decided I can't spend this kind of time on on computers anymore. That's right. uh, not a it's a lot. Life. 
Yeah. 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 It's a lot. Um, uh, our guy that maintains our state website, you know, he's at that point right now, you know, to where it's like, uh, and he's got several other things that he does as well. Oh so. yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, he, he, I think he's uh, coming down to burnout mode. So. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, cool. I'm gonna let and you go. We'll be in touch and uh, put this uh, in the bed. So. Hopefully, yeah, I'm gonna have sure something good to report. Well, good or bad, we need to find out one, e either way. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll make uh, lemons out of lemonade, or was it the opposite way around? <laughs> lemonade out of lemons. You know what I'm talking. About. I All do. right. Good night, fellas. I appreciate everybody <laughs> coming, man. We hope to see you again soon. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Keep on. All right. <laughs>